Hello, everyone, and welcome to FEMC in downtown Fort Worth. And whether you're joining us in person here on Fifth Street or you're part of our community joining us online, welcome to you Sunday. My name is Parker, and I'm so glad that you're all joining us for worship this morning. If you are here with us in person, I want to draw your attention to the black pads that are on the edge of every pew. Please let us know that you attended this morning by filling that out. If you're joining us online, there's a registration tab available on our website. Now, before we start our worship this morning, we do have a few announcements. Registration for Revolution Weekend is now open. Revolution Weekend is our big midwinter retreat for 7th through 12th graders hosted at Glen Lake Camp and Retreat Center on January 27th through 29th. Registration can be found at online at fumcfw.org slash youth or through any of our social medias. Registration for spring confirmation for our sixth grade confirmation class, also hosted at Glen Lake, is, will open tomorrow. Regist registration links for that will be emailed out to all our confirmation families, so keep an eye out for your email for more information. Volunteers are needed for Thanksgiving basket assembly this week. Food items for the Thanksgiving baskets will be moved into Wesley Hall this Friday, and we need volunteers to help unload the food and set things up for Saturday, which is when we'll need even more volunteers to help assemble boxes of food, package fruit and vegetables, and welcome guests and case managers for box pickup. We're hoping to pack and distribute 800 boxes of food, so we're going to need a lot of help. If you would like more information, you can find that on the website, and if you want to sign up for volunteer, there's a QR code in your bulletin. All of, our, all of our words of response will be on the screen, but if you would like them a little bit larger in front of you, you can either grab a paper copy of the bulletin from the back of the sanctuary, or you can open the camera app on your phone and point it towards a little square QR code on the back of the pew in front of you, which will pull it up on your phone. Now, let us begin our time of worship with our prelude. Hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. My name is Georgia and I'm excited to lead you in our call to worship this morning. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship? I'll read the leader portion and you'll respond with the all responses you can find on the screens. God, we are people who want to be seen, known, and loved. Show us that we are good just as we are. When we feel like we're on our own with, with no one to hear our questions, you draw closer to us, surrounding us with your love. Amen.
Hello, my name is Lily, and this morning I will be leading us in our affirmation of faith. Please stand as you are able and join with me as we affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite now uh, the children to come forward for our time together. Kids, come on down. Good morning. So glad you're here. I've got a box. We need to find out what's in the box. But before that, we have to sing the song. And congregation, I'd like us all to sing this one together. Um, here we go. What's in the box today? What's in the box today? Tell us, tell us, tell us, please. What's in the box today? And oh, there's a lot in the box today. This is a full box. One is a duck, a kindness duck. We've been having these around the church for a long time, almost two years. Now say, Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark. why is there a kindness duck, why is there a kindness duck? In, your box? in your box? You ask the best questions. The reason is because today is World Kindness Day. Did you know that? Today. And I think it's really neat that it's World Kindness Day on the same day that it's Youth Sunday. Because all these youth who have prepared worship for us, they're showing their care for their church and for their friends and for their church family by all the, the work that they've put into it, the practice. All of that is a wonderful way that our youth is being kind to us. I think that's just wonderful. But I also want to explore some different ways that we can be kind, because being kind is different than being nice. Nice is nice, but when we're kind, we really go out of our way to show care for others. So I thought we'd play a game to sharpen some of our skills at kindness, and one of those big skills is listening, really, truly listening in a noisy, loud, talkative world Oh boy, do we need some listeners. So I thought we'd play a game. You'll play a game? Yes. So in the box, I've got some musical instruments. I've got three instruments. I've got a drum. I've got a rattle. And I've got, a, luckily, two cymbals, because, you know, one cymbal doesn't make much of a sound, does it? But that's much more symbolic. All right, so here's how the game is going to work. Simple game. I'm going to play one, and I'm going to keep them hidden, and you have to tell me which one I'm playing. Ready? You ready? Here we go. Are we going to be good listeners? All right, here we go. The maraca, the rattle. All right, here we go. Let's try another one. Oh, I thought I had you. I thought I was trying to be tricky. The cymbals. How about this one? The drum. Oh, you can see it? Well, don't look at it. All right. <laughs> All right, so easy enough, right? Listening is important. Now, 
We're going to play again, but here's the deal. Say, Mr. Mark, Mr. Mark. we're ready for round two. Ready for round two. The, harder round. the harder round. Dun, dun, dun. Here's how it works. I'm going to play two of the instruments, and you have to tell me which one I did not play. Ooh, all right, here we go. Here, here's the first one. Whoop, let me tilt it a little bit. Okay, so don't answer yet. Okay. Oh. I did not play the wrong. How many of you got that right? All right, let's try that one more time. All right, here we go. All right, well, look that way. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Ready? Okay, there's one. I didn't play the drum. Now say, Mr. Mark, what does that have to do with kindness? Well, what that has to do with kindness is sometimes listening means really being present and listening to what you hear, but sometimes one of the kindest things we can do is listen for what we don't hear. Listen, who hasn't had a chance to speak and making sure that they get a chance to speak or looking around and saying, who haven't we seen in a long time? Who are my church friends that I haven't seen in a while? And reaching out to them. Sometimes the kindest thing we can do is notice who we haven't seen or who we haven't heard so that we give them a chance to be seen and be heard. And when you all play such a great game, you get something really special. And what is this? A participant ribbon. Now, here's a deal. Say, Mr. Mark, what's the deal? Some people don't like participant ribbons. Some people are like, oh, everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a ribbon. And in my head, they all say it just like that. <laughs> but the way I look at it is, my real friends in my life, the people who matter the most to me, that my, my friend, it's not my friend, it's like, oh, well, why is he your friend, Mr. Mark? Oh, well, you know, one time he, he won a trophy for uh, football. He, he was a really good football player 30 years ago. That's why he's such a good friend. <laughs> Never. Or, oh yeah, he, he spelled all the words in the, in the spelling bee and got a blue ribbon, and so that's why. It's never the per person who does the best. You know who my friends are? You know who the kindest people to me are? Are the people who participate in my life, who show up, and who are there. You are showing one of the great acts of kindness right now by being here by participating. Just like our youth are being here right now, they're participating. They're being a part of this. We're being here for each other and not letting each other down simply by our presence. It's one of the kindest things you can do on World Kindness Day. Everybody look at the, you see all the grown-ups behind me and all the, all the youths? Say, hey everybody. Hey everybody. Happy World Kindness Day. Happy World Kindness Day. And one more, and one more thing I've got in my box is Will you please rise as you are able and stand and sing our hymn, 451, Be Thou My Vision, and any of the kids who are coming upstairs, meet right at that door. Go!
Hello, my name is Julia, and I will be reading our scripture this morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. When I have finished, I will close with God speaks to us for the reading of scripture, and we will all say, thanks be to God. The Lord said, go out and stand at the mountain before the Lord. A very strong wind tore through the mountains and broke apart stones before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. After there was a fire, there was a sound. Finn, quiet. God speaks to us for the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Eli Jeter. I'm a senior in high school, and life these past few couples of years has been a little difficult. With my mother falling ill to cancer and my just COVID happening and being alone for so long, I also sustained an injury that is I'm still kind of dealing with. It's been an experience. And I wonder a lot, and I think about all these things that have gone wrong, and then it's just kind of weighing me down, and I wonder if it'll ever just come off. I'm generally just stressed out, but stress is a normal part of life, and it's sometimes hard to deal with when you're alone, and it, if it sticks around long enough, you start to wonder, well, am I going to find okay? Will I be normal again? But in these experiences of stress, it's, it's hard to ask for help. That's something I'm not good with. Um, so sometimes there's someone there that you got in your corner to listen. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes there might be someone that you want to talk to, but you don't have up the courage or get, you get a little nervous, a little antsy. And you start to get overwhelmed with you know everything you're dealing with and all the things you're going through. But Isaiah 4... 5410 says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And as people and as a person, um, sometimes we feel like our little world that we have around us is falling to pieces, falling apart. And then you just got to like remember how God is always in your corner. He's willing to fight for you and how and how we have these this stressful times in our lives. And it's a, not see it as something to like weigh you down or you know, make you feel bad, but as an opportunity to test your will and your faith in God and your love so that you might grow and persevere through that struggle or hard time you're going through. Now, with God loving us and you know, us having that little peace place where we can rest in him, what do we do with this growth that we have in our love and lo the love that God has for us? We should, you use that love and show it to others. And in doing so, not just because we're supposed to, but because we want to, so that we can be that living example in someone else in our own lives of God's love, so that we can, we can rely on ourselves and not just ourselves and also other people. And with this love and compassion that we can find peace in, you know, we should let it kind of overwhelm us and share it with others so that it can pour out into their lives and that through with that pouring out through their lives, they can share it to others that they might need to have help so that we can use that love to affect those near and around us so that we might have it ripple throughout the world so that we can make a change. I'd like to welcome up my friend Elise. Hello, my name is Elise, and before I go further with this, I think I need to specify uh, that 
even before my high school experience, but especially now that I'm in high school, I have basically been a part of every fine art that I can locate, uh, whether it was playing piano when I was just five, or being in the children's choir, the junior worship leaders. Here at the church now, I'm part of the youth praise band and the Cornerstone Youth Choir. And at my school, I'm in the marching band, the pit orchestra, the choir, the jazz band. And these, all of these groups have different skills and abilities that they require, but they all have one thing in common. You need to listen to everyone else around you. Listening is what allows musicians to play together, to create one song, not just a bunch of noise. It allows everyone to get their chance to shine, but also prevents us from overpowering the melody. It tells us who needs to play louder or softer, who, which part needs to be heard, what style to play in, what tempo to play at. Now, I'm really going to focus in on the jazz band here, uh, because that requires potentially the most careful listening of all of these groups. Jazz often features soloists doing improvisation over a series of chords and rhythms provided by the rhythm section. That's me. Uh, and in particular, I play the piano, and I have friends on the bass and the drums who will play along with me. Now, this is a big job. While most people might play one solo in one song on a given concert, the rhythm section plays every single solo every single song. We are the background, the backbone that keeps everything on track and keeps everything holding together. It means we have to know what each individual soloist needs so that they can shine. Whether it's a quiet soloist who needs us to back off so that they can be heard, or someone who leaves a lot of space in their solo that I need to fill in. But despite all of the work that I'm putting in, Despite the work that any pianist puts in, the soloist almost always gets the spotlight. We'll always have some parent or judge or just random audience member come up and compliment the jazz band and the soloist and how great they were. But you hardly ever get someone to come up and say, oh yeah, that weird C major chord on the piano, that was great. <laughs> uh, and it can sometimes feel like the piano's not necessary, that it's unimportant. But without the pianist, the solos just feel hollow and empty, like they're missing something, even if you don't know what exactly it is. And more often than not, without a pianist there, the soloist will lose track of where they are in the music, and the piece just falls apart. And this isn't just a music thing. I've been advised to include a non-music example for everyone else. Uh, fair warning, I didn't write this because I don't understand football. Um, I come from a school that has been cons pretty consistently last uh, in the district football teams since my older sister, who's about to graduate college, uh, was here, so heads up. Uh, but on a football team, it's usually the quarterback or the running back or a wide receiver that gets the credit. But without linemen, nothing good is going to happen to the offense. But still, there's times when the backbone people like the pianist, feel unheard, that I feel unheard. It's not a unique experience to jazz performances. It's something we've all experienced at some point in our lives, at work, at school, just hanging out with friends. We've all felt unheard or unnoticed before, even when we're the backbone that's allowing growth to occur in the first place. We'd all like to think that's not true. I think we'd all like to believe that someone out there sees us, that someone is noticing what we're doing. Someone appreciates the work we're putting in. Maybe your friends, your coworkers, your kids. Maybe your spouse. Maybe it's God. Just like a jazz pianist, God listens to us and watches all of us in our individual, unique lives and provides each of us what we need to thrive. He takes on this ginormous job that it is to play in the background behind each and every one of our solos so that we can shine. He's that constant, small, quiet voice that helps drive us forward and keeps us from getting lost in all the noise and the complicated issues that separate us and make it so hard to understand each other. And despite all that he's doing to protect us, to shape us into better people, it's sometimes really easy to overlook all that God is doing for us. It's easy to lose track of God amidst the noise. 
we ignore God. We try to shift away. But he refuses to let us go. He is there behind our every moment. He doesn't leave us behind. He's always there, always listening, always in the background, even if we don't notice. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. In that scripture, God wasn't in the wind that's breaking the rocks. He's not in the earthquake or the fire. He's not big and loud. He's in the quiet, in the silence, in the gaps between all of the noise. God cares about every single one of us. He hears all of us and recognizes what makes us different and unique. And he's not trying to cover that up. He's trying to back us up so that we can stand out. And he refuses to overpower our voice, our sound, our solo. God wants to bring out the best in us by providing us a foundation to grow. So as we go back out into the world, I challenge you to listen to the people around you instead of trying to claim the spotlight. Try to be like God. Pay attention to what the people around you actually need, not just what you think they need. It can be hard. It can be really annoying sometimes. But it will make you a better, kinder person, the kind of person God is constantly calling all of us to be. And more than just that, you're helping other people find their way closer to God. You're guiding them back to the chords in the background that bring us all together to create one unified song. Thank you. And now I'm going to invite up my friend Carter. Hello. For anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Carter Ship, and I'm a senior at Pasco High School here in Fort Worth. Um, I've been around for quite a few youth Sundays, so when we started planning for today, I thought it would be a breeze that my experience from the past helped me ace this sermon. But the more time we spent prepping for the Sunday, the more time I spent listening to my friends talk about how they felt disconnected and unheard from their friends and family, I couldn't help but think, well, cool. Um, because you're looking at a guy that doesn't really struggle with feeling disconnected. I've been lucky enough to have two amazing parents that treated me like an equal almost as soon as I was old enough to talk. Part of this is that I'm an only child, but another part is that my dad is one of my best friends. Now, I swear I'm not a hermit whose only friends are his parents. I have other friends. It's just we're really close. I like to think that whether I grew up with him in Ida Bell or he grew up with me here in Fort Worth, we would still be close friends. My dad's prioritized me over work, over sleep, and I'd be lying to say if he wasn't the primary person I take inspiration from. Obviously, I have his dashing looks and his whimsical charm. <laughs> um, but I've also copied his colloquialisms, the way he stands, and even the cadence of his speech. For instance, I picked up on his tendency to drop into a conversation just to get a joke across which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you ask. But this isn't just me. Think about someone close to you, to you in your life, your spouse, your friends, someone in your family. You may see subtle differences, but to a complete stranger, you're much more alike than you think. We pick up on a lot of things from people that we spend the most time with, and it's almost impossible not to, purely because of the way that we are wired for connection. As another example, of being influenced by the, with the people that we spend the most time with. I've been in the youth ministry's office this summer as the unofficial intern. Before this, I wasn't self-centered, or at least I like to think I wasn't, but I definitely didn't hate the idea of being in the spotlight for as many things as possible in the youth. But as I spent time with our youth director, Matt, Br Matt Britt, what I come to learn is that it's equally enjoyable to watch friends blossom and support them than trying to be the center of attention. For example, Matt told me that his ideal Sunday gig would be to stand in the corner of a room where no one's watching and to play his guitar for everyone else to worship. The idea that rubbed off on me from the literal days that we spent together is that a supporting role can sometimes be more rewarding than the main focus of the show. This example of how, with my time with Matt shows how easy it is to become like those that we spend the most time with. What I've come to realize over the last years, months, and especially weeks, thinking about this idea of disconnect, is that we do this with God. 
I want to ask you something. And you don't have to raise your hand, just to yourself. How many of you have prayed for good grades, for the next promotion, for your team to win this weekend? Especially that last one if you're a Cowboys fan, right? I think we all have. We've taken this meaningful relationship with God, and we've turned it into a very transactional one. I need something, I pray to God, so God can give me what I need. Now, this isn't all bad. Some people pray for promotions so they can afford to put food on the table. Some people just desperately need a break, whatever it might be. But as it's been coined, we've turned God into a cosmic vending machine. Push the right combination of buttons and a miracle pops out. But honestly, with no judgment from me or Lance or from yourself, when's the last time you just checked in with God? When's the last time you prayed just to pray, not because you wanted or needed something? When's the last time you considered your relationship with God outside of a Sunday morning? I think we're all a little guilty of this. To be honest, I often walk out those doors and 30 minutes later, I have no idea what Matt or Lance has said. Sorry, guys. But what we know is that that's not how it's supposed to be. Our relationship is a two-way street and we have to find a way out of this rut, out of our habit of only going to God when we need something. We have to figure out how to reconnect in our relationship with God. As I'm sure anyone from the children's wing to the sanctuary can tell me, we were made in God's image. From the very beginning of the Bible, we're told that this is true. And just as a picture is a fraction of us, an incomplete version of who we really are, that's what we are of God. Now hear me out. This isn't some grim note. This is awesome. This means we have room to grow, room to strive, room to become more like God. Like I said earlier, the more time we spend with someone, the greater they influence us. The more time I spend with my dad or with Matt, the more like them I become. The more time we spend praying to create a relationship built off of love and not just wants and needs, the more we can become like God. You can be a part of this. You can invest in this relationship, and it doesn't matter if you're old or young, if you've been coming to this church for 60 years or if this is your first time here, or even how much time you devote to prayer. What matters is that we realize our relationship with God is like any other relationship. It takes time and effort, and the more we put into it, the more we get out of it. So if you've done what I've done and have checked out for this entire sermon, here's what I want you to take away. Your relationship with God is sacred, it's valuable, and it's uniquely yours. We can't continue to insert a dollar's worth of prayer into the cosmic vending machine and expect anything extraordinary. And I know it's hard, I know you're busy, trust me, I get it. But if you can't do anything else, all I ask is that every once in a while, connect with God. Because the more we, can, the more we do, the more we can become a little closer to the full image of God. Thank you. Now, please give a warm welcome to my friend, Megan Linguist. Good morning. My name is Megan Linguist, and I'm a senior at Trinity High School. I have been a part of Fir First Fort Worth since I was born. I have been on countless trips and retreats with our youth ministries. I'm an artist that loves oil painting, and I'm a four-year returning varsity volleyball player for my school. I've played volleyball since I was in middle school. My middle school volleyball experience was fun and exciting, and I loved just getting to play. I loved being on the court, and I loved being with my teammates, and I loved winning. Part of what made it so fun was that we all, as individuals, wanted to win for our own personal pleasure, because winning is fun, more fun than losing. But that quickly changed in high school. In high school, volleyball changed into wanting to win out of fear, fear of running all practice, fear of getting chewed out by our three scary coaches, and fear of causing our coach another seizure. The love I had for the game had been taken away. My high school volleyball experience was very traumatic for m multiple reasons. My coach had a lot of health issues, and she was so invested in the game that it would cause seizures. I remember after one game we lost, our coach was so upset, she started to seize while yelling at us. And her brother, our other coach, got in our faces and told us we were killing her because we had lost to a bad team. Don't get me wrong, I love this coach because she's an amazing person, but her program caused a lot of damage. Can you imagine someone looking at you, telling you that if you weren't good enough, that this person you deeply cared about, that you looked up to, might die? 
Our program involved a lot of physical strain as well as mental. We ran a lot. She could find any reason to make us run. If we were one minute late to practice, if we talked while she was talking, if we didn't shag a ball, if we dropped a pole, if we lost to a team she felt we shouldn't have lost to. Everything we did was timed, and if we didn't make the time, we were all running and running and running. All of this, the mental and physical demands and aspects affected me so much to the point that it affected my eating. Volleyball began to make me so anxious that I'd wake up scared to go to volleyball. I would barely eat breakfast. I would completely skip lunch because I was so scared of what was coming during practice. And when I would finally get home, I'd skip dinner because we ran so much in practice, I would puke if I ate anything. I felt like I was very obviously not doing well and that I was struggling, that I was falling apart. But I was expected to finish my, out my four years. I felt like I was saying everything I could, that I needed help, but no one seemed to be listening, no one seemed to care. I would go to the bathroom during practice every day and pray. I would pray that coach would be in a good mood, that we would play well enough that maybe, just maybe, today would be the first good day in a run of good days. I would pray because I had hope, not hope in some abstract higher power that is far away, but a hope deep in my soul, and a God that sees me and knows me and is true for me, that God is listening, that God cares, that God would continue to show up for me, even if I felt like no one else could see my struggle. At the beginning of my junior year, I hit rock bottom. I couldn't stand being in that gym. I couldn't hold in my emotions. I'd cry openly in the middle of practice because I simply could not control it. I couldn't hold it in anymore. But my coach noticed, and we started having a series of meetings where I told her my experience, where I could finally be honest with her about what I was going through. She helped me find therapy, and she started making small changes to parts of her program. Little by little, things got better. But even if things were still hard, I felt as if she listened to me and cared about me enough to look outside herself to make these minor changes that in all honesty made the biggest difference in my life. That feeling of being heard and understood is all I needed. This made my junior season by far the best volleyball season I've had in a long time. I wish I could tell you that my senior year was the best I've ever had for volleyball and that our coach rebuilt the relationship she had with the team. But after my junior year, that coach stepped away from volleyball for her health reasons. I wasn't sure if I wanted to come back, but I was expected to finish out my four years, so I did. And our new coach is different, not nearly as intense. We didn't have to run as much, and there was, wasn't even close to the same amount of mental toughness needed. But the love I had for volleyball didn't come back. I don't think that the time I spent playing volleyball was wasted. I don't think I had an I had what I had to go through was right, but I did learn some things. I've spent a lot of time thinking about why I prayed in the bathroom. I don't know what I expected. I didn't think that things would really get any better. I just needed to feel like someone somewhere was listening, that someone cared, that someone had heard me. I knew that God did. I knew I could just talk to God and that God would listen, that God could hear my prayers, that I could say what I needed to say and someone would hear me. I think all those prayers helped me feel ready to talk to my coach when we started having these conversations. I had talked to God a lot about this at times, so I knew I could talk to her. And I guess I had hoped that she would listen the same way God does. I don't know what it is that you need someone to hear. I don't know what's going on in your life where you just need someone to listen to what you're saying, to really hear you but there is someone listening. God is always there for you to talk to. God will, will always hear you. And I guess what that means for us is that we should do the same for people around us. If we all have these things th where we need someone, anyone to listen to us, why can't it be you or me or the person next to you? If we think that we should be following God's example, doing what God does for us, for others, then we, sh we are supposed to talk a little less and start listening to each other more. Maybe then we would all feel a little more heard. Amen.
Hello, my name is Jules, and this morning I will be leading our time of prayer together. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in times of confusion, adversity, and stress, and we admit that sometimes we don't do a good job taking a break. We push and we push, only slowing down when we have to, expecting the same of the people around us. We pray that you help us communicate with the people around us that we are doing our best, but we all need time for rest into time to take a break. We struggle to listen to ourselves, to listen to each other, to listen to you, and we feel the deep need to be understood and to be heard. Lord, we thank you for being reliable in times when we feel discouraged or alone. We thank you for listening and for always being there when we need you the most. We continue to pray for others who need relief, breaks, and time to come up for air, just as we do, as we pray in the words of Jesus, that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Abby, and in just a moment, the ushers are going to come forward to help us with our time of giving. The plates are going to come around, and you're invited to place any offerings or gifts in the plates, as well as your pledge for the upcoming year. There's also a card in the pew in front of you. It says, I give online, that has both directions on how to give online, but you are invited to put that in the plate on its way by, if that is how you give. Your gifts, your offerings, help support the ministries of this church, including our youth ministries, and we are so thankful that you make all of this possible through your continuous, generous giving. We also wanted to take a special moment to recognize Allison Beck, the Cornerstone Youth Choir's collaborative pianist. This is Allison's first time playing in services with, Cor with Cornerstone, and we wanted to take this opportunity to say welcome and thank you. In just a moment, the ushers are going to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Will you please join me in a blessing and prayer over these gifts? Good and loving God, please bless as we return to you part of what you have given us. Use it for the strengthening of your church, the accomplishment of your mission, and the changing of your world. Amen.
Thank you all for joining us for Youth Sunday. My name is Avery and this is my friend Madeline. And in a minute, I'm going to lead our benediction. After that, you're invited to remain standing and join us in the singing and yelling and dancing for our congregational benediction. So to help us get ready, I'm going to invite some of my friends up to help us lead as we close. I wanted to take a minute to invite you to join us in Wesley Hall for a quick celebration. There's plenty of coffee and we'd love to say hi. Also a quick reminder, if you want to learn anything else about how to get connected at church uh, or find more about joining the church, you will find a place called On Ramp and you can find all that information there. If you're a first time guest, we have a special gift for you that you can pick up there as well. At the conclusion of our time together, we will have members of the congregational care team available down at the front of the sanctuary that will be able will be available to pray with anyone who would like someone to pray with. Now, if you would please stand as you're able and join me in our benediction. As our gathering will soon be ending, where will we go and what will we do? We will go out and be God's people in the world. May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.